for that. And just because you see a black man driving in a nice car does not mean it's stolen. I stole that one, but not because I'm black. In the last few years, criminal justice has been of increasing and persistent concern for many Americans, particularly as that concern regards perceptions of racial discrimination. From the death of George Floyd, which inspired, well, let's just say passionate protests throughout the summer of 2020, to the ongoing discontent in response to the results of the Kyle Rittenhouse case. The issues of policing and court fairness have been continually of public discourse and demonstration. But these court cases serve as exemplars, potentially, of injustice in and of themselves, outside of the criminal acts they are designed to adjudicate. This now results in increasing desires to seemingly intimidate the system. From a reporter linked to MSNBC following the jury bus in the Rittenhouse case, I was trying to... You trying to what? Just do what they told me to do. So New York told you to follow a vehicle? Yeah. I ain't even gonna name the people that I know that's up in the, in the Kenosha, I mean, in the Kenosha trial. But there's cameras in there. Yep. It's definitely cameras up in there and there's definitely people taking pictures of the juries and everything like that. We know what's going on. To an activist showing up outside the alleged home of the judge in the Kim Potter trial and alluding to having her evicted, if not worse. That's her! That's the judge! We need those cameras in that courtroom, lady! So how does the criminal justice system itself influence perceptions of injustice, bias, and racism? Today, let's look at how news stories and criminal trials become seen as racially motivated and how that framing influences perceptions of the criminal justice system. Further, let's examine how Americans of different backgrounds perceive that system and its fairness or injustice by looking to the data. But first, and because this is a particularly depressing topic to discuss, more than ever during a time of the year which is supposed to be marked by giving and goodwill to our fellow man, let me tell you about this video sponsor, which hopefully will bring some joy at least into your online experiences. And that's Atlas VPN. When the weather grows cold and we're all stuck inside more than we generally have been over the last two years, it's normal to just want to cuddle around the warm glow of our various media devices, and to ensure that you've got the best out of your mediated experiences, you definitely need a virtual private network or VPN. Whether it comes to hiding your browsing history to prevent particularly nosy loved ones, or more heinously, naughty list hackers or even governments themselves, glowing as much as said screen from taking a gander at your Christmas gift purchase history, or to get access to classic holiday media not available in your region, if you don't have a VPN, you're leaving yourself exposed and maybe even a little lacking in the Christmas cheer department. While you'll definitely want to avoid festive failures of titanic proportion like Santa Inc., if any of your holiday favorite films aren't available where you live, from Scrooge to Die Hard, two of my favorites, you can easily turn on Atlas VPN and change your location to access those movies or programs with your existing accounts on streaming services like Amazon and Netflix. Of course, my personal favorite Christmas film, Survive Style 5+, isn't available streaming anywhere. But hey, that's a rare example of an esoteric Japanese film that no one but me probably cares about anyway. Regardless, for all of your holiday needs, be it to protect your browsing privacy from snoops or accessing Christmas classics, check out Atlas VPN, linked down below in the description and in the pinned comment to get 86% off a three-year plan with Atlas, along with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So now that we're bundled up with the protection offered by a comfy VPN, Let's examine something that's the antithesis of Christmas cheer. And unfortunately, that's crime and punishment. How do people come to view an event as racist? Well, in the case of Kyle Rittenhouse, clearly it was media framing, if not overt lies. Lies which have persisted from the likes of The Atlantic even after the conclusion of the trial when all the facts had been made overwhelmingly public and there was no more possibility for excusable errors but we need to punish people that think that they can cross state lines, have an AR-15, and shoot people. In a state that he doesn't even live in, and then he crossed state lines with it. You're right, self-defense on its face is not white supremacy, but traveling across state lines with an AR-15 to intimidate people is absolutely white supremacy. Isn't that cute? But it's wrong! What about cases like those of Dante Wright or George Floyd, which have been major examples in the public eye that have portrayed the criminal justice system itself as inherently discriminatory? Or that of Ahmaud Arbery or Jesse Smollett, which evoke images of mobs of hooded Klansmen enacting hate crimes, albeit to significantly different degrees of severity and certainly in the latter case a spiral of absurdity rather than realism given that Jesse's lawyer, apparently, tried to stage a hate crime of her own by claiming that the judge lunged at her before running out of the courtroom in tears with her mommy. 
Yeah, that's all something that actually happened and is just one of many indicators that these cases are getting racialized and radicalized to a degree that defy not just courtroom decorum, but rationality, and even call into question how any of this is actually happening. I don't know how an adult attorney fleeing the courtroom to cry to her mother because the case isn't going her way stacks up to Thomas Littlefinger Binger pointing a gun at the jury or his co-counsel James Lunchbox Krauss similarly yelling at them in his closing when their case similarly wasn't going well, all while arguing this image of a mogus was sus enough to convict upon. But let's just say the racialization of these cases is producing some rather ridiculous results in the court. So what does make a criminal case racialized? Nelson Sambonmatsu and McClurkey in 2007 sought to answer this question in an experiment of black and white Americans from Columbus, Ohio. Subjects read a short report describing the shooting of an 18-year-old African-American by a white police officer in Baltimore. The story was vague and, frankly, a common enough occurrence in the greatest city in America as to describe pretty much any given daily event there. Baltimore is literally S-tier murder capital. You will die. There were six different versions of this news report. In the control condition, there was no label of the incident. In the five other conditions, this quote appeared at the end of the article. We cannot tolerate this kind of racist behavior from our police officers. In the anonymous condition, the article stated the person making the comment did not want to be identified. In the remaining four conditions, the statement was attributed to a Richard Kirby. Kirby was described either as black or white, Republican or Democrat. Perceptions of the event as being racist or indicative of police brutality, beliefs about personal political parties, opinions towards Kirby, attitudes towards race and faith in the criminal justice system were all measured. Black subjects consistently were more likely to believe that the shooting was racially motivated and that the officer was racist than were whites. However, this disparity was reduced when general beliefs about the fairness of the criminal justice system were taken into account, along with expectations of racial injustice and individual feelings of racial resentment. That is, race alone did not predict that an incident would be considered racist. However, when combined with other factors, including persistent negative beliefs about the criminal justice system, produced a tendency within black Americans to be more prone to see a police shooting as the result of racism. In regards to perceptions of the politician who commented on the case, black participants were influenced both by racial and party information, interestingly being most persuaded by the black Republican speaker, closely followed by the white Democrat. White respondents were seemingly more influenced by the politician's race than his politics. Specifically, whites were more likely to believe the claim that the case was racially motivated when Kirby was also white. In general, black Democrats were seen as most likable, trustworthy, and knowledgeable politicians, while white Republicans were rated lowest on these items. If that seems a bit surprising, I should note that these data were collected in 2003 during the Bush Jr. administration. And although still three years before Dick Cheney shot someone and just got away with it, it was not a period of time wherein a lot of people were that likely to see Republicans as particularly trustworthy. All respondents believed that the black Democrat politician was more likely to describe the incident as racist, and they predicted that white Republicans would be the least likely to do so. There was some influence of political party on perceptions that the politician was himself racially motivated in his statement. Specifically, black people thought that Democrats were more influenced by a general belief that police officers were racist, while whites thought that black Republicans were very influenced by such general beliefs, but not white Republicans. This would likely explain why black people were more trusting of the white Democrat to be accurate in their report of racism than black Democrats, who they see as being potentially more biased. Black participants in particular noted that black Republicans were unlikely to experience political gain via an accusation of racism, and thus were perhaps more likely to be telling the truth than were black Democrats. In turn, white participants were more likely to believe claims of racism when they came from a white politician, despite seeing those white politicians as generally less sincere, perhaps seeing the black politician as more honest, but inaccurate in his assessment of the scenario. As such, race does seem to play a role in perceptions of whether or not a crime is in some way racist, but not so directly as we might anticipate. Not all black people believe that any shooting of a young black person is inherently racially motivated, or at least they didn't in 2003. However, those with an extant distrust of the criminal justice system were more sensitive to such a belief. In terms of the persuasive nature of political figures who made comments about the case, Interestingly, black politicians are seen as less persuasive than our white speakers for white Americans, if only because black politicians are seen as potentially overzealous in their tendency to leap to a racially motivated conclusion. In turn, black Americans were more likely to believe in the honesty of racially motivated police violence when it came from a black Republican politician, perhaps being aware of the existence of race grifters who seemed to make a living by inciting racial animus in response to any interracial criminal interaction. Thus, while black people may be more likely to see any kind of killing of a black person as racist, the framing of the event and their personal experiences with criminal justice both significantly influenced this perception, 
And as such, not all black people are going to blindly believe claims that, for example, Kyle Rittenhouse was racially incentivized to shoot three white people. But they may when they have had individual negative histories with law enforcement or the courts, and particularly when they see people of various political backgrounds, particularly black Republicans, condemning the event. However, the opinions of white Democrats are also highly persuasive. So yes, as long as enough politicians and speakers espouse the idea that Kyle Rittenhouse was a racist, for example, it's almost inevitably going to create that perception, particularly among black Americans, who are inherently considerably a bit more prone to be distrustful of criminal justice, to see a case wherein no black people were injured as still somehow racist inherent. Relatedly, one critique of the jury in the Rittenhouse trial was that it was not comprised of more black jurors, and therefore also indicative of some form of racial injustice. I'm not exactly sure why that matters, considering, as previously stated, no black people were injured or killed by Rittenhouse. But the racial narrative that continually revolved around the case raised questions of who a jury of his peers should be, a selection of people that generally reflects the local population, or people whose social group, whatever you think that should be, race, sex, party, affiliation, etc., were actually affected by it. So despite the fact that Kyle, again, didn't hurt any black people, it is possible that he might have been found guilty if the racial composition of the jury was different. And how might jury composition affect other trial outcomes, such as the guilt of defendants in the Ahmaud Arbery case? For answers, we can look to Somers and Ellsworth 2000 across two studies of race and juror perceptions of guilt. University students read 12 summaries of different trials, consisting of the arguments made by both the prosecution and the defense. In all five cases, the case involved interracial conflict. These cases described a, a college basketball player who allegedly assaulted a teammate after a heated locker room dispute in which racial language was used. I'll show you who's boss in this gym. B, a young man who, along with four friends, allegedly surrounded a stranded motorist, told him that he should not have been in that neighborhood and robbed him of his wallet. C, a frustrated law school applicant who was upset about racial policies in the admissions process and allegedly held an admissions secretary hostage at gunpoint. Boy, that escalated quickly. D, a middle-aged man who allegedly slapped his girlfriend at the bar after she made embarrassing comments about him in front of his friends. <laughs> and E, an older man who allegedly burned down a church attended by congregants who were not of his same race. In all of these trials, the victim, or the church congregation, and the defendant were of different races, either white or black. Subjects were asked to rate the guilt of the defendant in each case and the effectiveness of the prosecution's argument, as well as make note of any situational pressures and aspects of the defendant's personal character that they believed were responsible for that behavior. Finally, participants were asked to determine a sentence for each defendant, ranging from a probation to the maximum sentence possible for each crime. White mock jurors did not differ significantly in their reported perceptions of guilt for black or white defendants, while black jurors did being far more likely to say that a white defendant was guilty than a black defendant both within group and comparatively to white jurors. Similarly, white jurors tended to recommend more lenient sentences for black defendants, while black jurors tended to recommend harsher sentences for white defendants, meaning both groups tended to suggest that black defendants be given shorter sentences. Despite this difference in sentencing in white jurors, much as with their perceptions of guilt, race played no role in their judgment about the strength of the defense. In turn, black jurors reported that the defense was far stronger over 1.5 times stronger for the black defendant than the white one. Attributions of criminality to the defendant's race was non-significant in white jurors, while black jurors felt that a black defendant's personality was less responsible for the criminal act than it was for white defendants. Uh, so yeah, it seems that perhaps it is possible that the outcomes of court cases may be very different based on the racial composition of the jury, but not in a way that would necessarily unfairly prejudice black defendants whose jury is predominantly white. Instead, it seems that black jurors are consistently more lenient towards black defendants while being consistently harsher towards white defendants, while white jurors tend to judge defendants fairly evenly regardless of race. I guess now we know why people were so upset about there being too many white people on the Rittenhouse jury to the point of trying to follow them home, despite the Kenosha area being generally about as white as Coke on a polar bear, and not the Christmas commercial kind. These scholars suggested that this result could be because black participants might anticipate that the summary they read of the case was not an accurate depiction of reality when it described a black defendant, perhaps believing in police corruption or discriminatory practices within the criminal justice system to have set up the black defendant. To use Hanlon's razor, 
What I'm saying is I'm not really sure that this propensity was inherently racist on the part of black people towards whites, but rather indicative of the result of telling a group of people pretty much their entire lives that the criminal justice system exists exclusively to bail out whitey at the expense of innocent black folks. Don't trust whitey. Lord loves a working man, don't trust whitey. Part of the reason for this perception, or so the researchers hypothesized, might also be that each of the cases described a situation which may be the subject of racial stereotypes. For example, black subjects who read about an old man burning down a church because he disliked the race of the congregants is pretty, well, let's just say racially coded, with coded being spelled with three Ks. So outside of the possibility that the perpetrator was Clayton Bigsby, the black participants may have found the case highly suspect and likely some kind of setup if the defendant was black. As such, in a second experiment, the researchers altered the barroom fight scenario, wherein a middle-aged man allegedly slapped his girlfriend after she embarrassed him in front of his friends. Larry, what the hell are you doing? Oh, Larry! Larry, you can't just... Oh, Larry! Oh, are you all right? How did... Some subjects read that the man and his girlfriend were both African-American, while others read that both he and his girlfriend were white. All other information about the victim and perpetrator was identical in these two cases, including their weight, height, and profession, with the man being a computer analyst and his girlfriend being a daycare worker. In the summary of the trial, some subjects read that the victim recalled her boyfriend had mentioned race in relationship to the conflict, saying that she should, quote, know better than to talk that way to a black, or white, depending on the condition, man in front of his friends like that. Although one of these scenarios might be a little bit more believable than the other, to be fair. While others only read that the girlfriend's testimony included her recalling a similar statement, but with no mention of the defendant's race. After reading a summary of the trial, subjects were asked to rate the guilt of the defendant, how much they believed he was a violent or aggressive person, if they believed the conflict was racially motivated, and then asked to assign punishment ranging from $2,000 in fines to six months in jail. When the victim had recalled her boyfriend generally justifying his abuse by saying that she should have known better than to talk to a man like that, rather than a man of a specific race, results were a bit different from the first experiment. This time, white jurors rated the black defendant as more guilty than the white one, while black jurors rated the white defendant as more guilty to somewhat similar degrees. Similarly, jurors believed that the defendant of another race should receive a harsher sentence than the defendant of their own race. However, black jurors recommended more severe sentences for white defendants than white jurors did for black defendants. White jurors believed that black defendants were more aggressive and violent, while black jurors believed that white defendants were more aggressive and violent. White and black jurors generally believed that race was not overly involved in the incident when it involved a white man hitting his white girlfriend, but both believed that race was more important when the victim and perpetrator were both black, with black jurors thinking that race was significantly relevant to the case. In other words, both black and white people felt defendants of another race were more guilty, were more combative, and were more deserving of harsher sentences when they read about a conflict between couples of the same race. Again, not their own, specifically when race was not mentioned in that conflict. In turn, when race was specifically mentioned by the victim when recalling the words of her boyfriend after he hit her, I did not. Things were quite a bit different and more reminiscent of the findings from the first experiment. This time, white jurors viewed black defendants as less guilty, while black jurors maintained a belief that white defendants were always more guilty. White jurors suggested less harsh sentencing for black defendants, while black defendants suggested harsher sentences for white defendants. Black jurors believed the black defendant was less aggressive and violent, while white jurors reported no significant differences in perceived aggression or violence in black defendants. While black jurors believed that race played a moderate role in either case of domestic abuse, white jurors reported race as being more salient when the couple were white than when the couple was black and race had been mentioned. These findings are seemingly indicative that when race is specifically brought up as a factor in a criminal case, white people attempt to be more lenient towards black defendants, while black people tend to be as harsh towards white defendants, whether or not race is specifically mentioned. It would seem to me then that perhaps, when white people think that race is a salient factor in a criminal case, even involving two people who are not white, they tend to be more lenient towards black defendants, maybe not wanting to be seen as racist themselves. However, when race was not a salient factor in the criminal case, whites perceived black defendants as more guilty than white defendants. But the degree of this labeling of guilt from whites towards blacks only ever even approached the intergroup animosity that black jurors seemingly experienced towards white defendants, regardless of racial salience in any given case. Thus, yeah, it is perhaps true that Rittenhouse would have maybe been found guilty if more of the jurors in his case had been black, given that black jurors seem to just be a little bit more harsh towards white defendants, regardless of whether or not race has anything to do with the trial, as it did not in the Rittenhouse case. Oh, so you said that it was a white guy. What happened? 
These data may also indicate that black defendants are less likely to be found guilty in issues where race is a factor, say as it was seen as being in the cases of George Floyd or Dante Wright, when the jurors are white. While black jurors are always more lenient towards black defendants and more punitive towards white defendants, according to these two experiments, when race is a factor in a case, white people actually tend to be more lenient as well, but then only towards black defendants, at least in cases wherein there was no interracial group conflict. These researchers, however, were perplexed by the findings and suggested instead that the reason why white jurors were not more harsh towards black defendants when race was not salient was because they um didn't disapprove of a black guy beating his similarly black girlfriend because they approve of black on black crime. Y yeah, that argument's not great, but what was definitely worth investigating was whether or not these effects present in this study of jurors rating of guilt or innocence of a perpetrator who aggressed against a member of the same race is how interracial conflict might influence those results. Thus, Somers and Ellsworth 2001 mostly replicated the second experiment in that previous study, but this time with a few differences. White participants read a summary of a case involving a high school basketball player who assaulted his teammate in the locker room, causing serious bodily injury. The prosecution argued that the player was jealous that he had been replaced on the starting lineup by his teammate, while the defense asserted that although the two had argued, it wasn't until a third student attempted to restrain the defendant that he broke free, trying to escape, and accidentally hit the victim in the process. In one condition, race was made salient through the use of testimony of another teammate who stated that the defendant was one of only one or two members on the team of his same race, either white or black depending on the condition. Although, I mean, it's a basketball team, come on. What do you mean? Well, it's just that Jews can't play basketball and had been the subject of insults and obscene remarks from his teammates. The defendant was either described as white, 6 foot 2, 195 pounds, and 18 years old, Matthew Clinton, or as a black 18-year-old of the same height and weight named Andre Barclay. Really, Somers and Ellsworth? Andre Barclay. Am I a man who defines the corporate ethos, or does the corporate ethos define me? Well, the victim was described as white, 6 foot, 165 pounds, and 16 years old. Again, Matthew, or black and 16 years old, again, Andre, with the same height and weight. As with the previous studies, subjects were asked to determine the guilt of the defendant, their confidence in that verdict, as well as the strength of the prosecution's argument, and what sentence they believed was appropriate for the defendant, if found guilty, ranging from no punishment to up to four years in prison. Across all respondents, 74% recommended the guilty verdict but the salience of race affected this verdict in that when the jury had read that the defendant was a minority on the team and had been subject to bullying, they were equally likely to find him guilty regardless of race. These white jurors found white defendants guilty to similar degrees when race was not salient, but were more likely, in that condition, to vote to convict the black defendant. That is, when race was not mentioned in regards to the specifics of the case, white jurors were more likely to convict a black defendant accused of attacking his teammate. When race was not salient, jurors were far more confident about twice as much so in the guilty verdict against the black student, felt that the prosecution's case against the black defendant was better, that the defense's case was weaker, and recommended a harsher sentence compared to the white student. In opposition, when race was salient, the white jurors were more confident in their guilty verdict against the white athlete, believed the case against him was better, and that his defense was worse, minimally so, and sentenced the white athlete to a slightly harsher sentence than his black counterpart. Once again, it seems that when white people think that race is a factor in a criminal case, they will be more likely to punish other white people. However, when they think race is not a factor, they may be more likely to find a guilty verdict when judging a black defendant. As such, it doesn't seem that white people are particularly racist against black defendants inherently all of the time, and instead are only more likely to assume the guilt of a black defendant when race was not brought up as an issue in the case. In turn, based on previous data that we saw from this cohort, that's not the way that black jurors generally respond to criminal justice cases involving white people in that African Americans do not tend to give the same benefit of the doubt to white defendants under almost any circumstance. Well, in turn, white people do, particularly when they may be afraid that not being lenient towards a black defendant might imply some racist tendency on their own part. So, now that I've said juror so many times it's losing all meaning, Royal juror is the true story of Roy Jenner, who's pure fear and shares a terrible murder. Excuse me. <coughs> Meg. Let's continue by asking why might these differences between racial groups be the case? Is it racism or fear is being seen as racist or something else? 
We can look to Johnson 2008 for some evidence on how black and white Americans generally see the justice system and how their attitudes towards it may differ to better understand why white jurors are generally less likely to suggest harsher punishments for black defendants when serving as jurors than are black jurors, judging white defendants. Using data from the 2001 Race, Crime, and Public Opinion study, Johnson found that white people seemed to be more punitive than were black people, with whites being more supportive of trying juveniles as adults, more strict parole boards, favorability towards three-strike laws, and desiring penalties for violent criminals. Specifically, when asked about their favorability towards punitive actions for criminal acts, having a friend or relative who had been incarcerated, income, and fear of crime were all significant predictors for black people while political conservatism and racial resentment were significant predictors for white people. In general, white people were more punitive than were black people, even when controlling for other personal logical and social variables. Specifically, income, fear of crime, political conservatism, and attribution of crime as being due to individual failings rather than systemic issues, all being positively related to support for punitiveness, while having an incarcerated friend or family member was negatively related to punitiveness. Civics who believe in the existence of systemic racism in the justice system were less supportive of punitive policies than those who did not. While stereotypes did not affect support for punitive actions, resentment towards black people resulted in more support of punitive criminal justice penalties than those who did not express such views. In Johnson's full model, those who believed that racial bias could have colored, pun intended I guess, their perceptions were less supportive of punitiveness, while negative racial stereotyping and racial resentment had a significant positive effect on support for harsh penalties. These results may help explain some of the other findings we've seen, in that while white people may be a little bit more favorable towards criminal justice, when they fear that their perceptions of the justice system could have been influenced by subconscious racial biases, they become more lenient towards black people than they might otherwise be. Again, though, this does not seem to be the case for African Americans towards whites. It's also possible that these findings are due to a perception in black people that whites abuse the criminal justice system to unfairly target their community and thus judge whites more harshly as a form of restitution, using that same system to punish whites in retribution for the very real injustices that have been experienced by African Americans over the course of US history, from slavery to segregation. So, what variables influence perceptions of the justice system unfairly targets and mistreats black people that might influence jury decisions? For answers, we can look to Buckler et al. 2011, who examined differences in perceptions of injustice in Americans. Subjects were asked to respond to the following question. As you may know, young black men have a higher chance than most people of winding up incarcerated. Please tell me whether you think the following is why this is true. Courts are more likely to convict black men than whites. To determine their belief in the existence of court disparity. Persons with prior incarceration were more likely to believe that the courts were unjust, rather predictably. However, people who had vicarious experiences with incarceration, that is, knowing someone who had been incarcerated, were not more likely to hold such beliefs. African Americans, Hispanics, and people of other ethnic or racial minorities were all more likely than whites to believe that black people were unfairly treated by the criminal justice system. Males, those with higher incomes, and more religious people tended to believe that the courts were more fair, while Democrats and those with higher degrees of education believed the courts were less fair towards black people. Perceptions of court disparity were most strongly predicted by respondent race or ethnicity, while comparatively, personal experience with incarceration was the fifth strongest predictor in their initial two models. In the third model, when looking only at individuals with no incarceration experience, fear of being the victim of a violent crime and having been a victim of a crime were both positive predictors of belief that blacks were treated unjustly. Statistically, we could surmise that those people probably live in higher crime areas. No judgments, just statistically speaking. In the fourth model, using prior incarceration as a predictor of perceived injustice, males, religious persons, and higher earners who had previously been jailed were less likely to see the system as unfair towards African Americans, while those who had completed more education and had been incarcerated saw the system as less fair. Further, those with an incarceration experience who were personally afraid of crime were also more likely to see the system as unjust. Comparing these first four models, indicates that there is a greater difference between the perceptions of injustice between black people and white people who had been incarcerated at some point than there was between those of the two racial groups who had no prior incarceration experience. In their fifth model, among those who had never been incarcerated, there was not a statistically significant difference between black Americans and Hispanics in their perceptions of injustice. Meanwhile, in the sixth model, previous incarceration intensified the gap between African Americans and Hispanics on their perceptions of court-based injustice. Analysis was indicative that, again as we might expect, more incarceration experience, either directly or vicariously, resulted in more perceptions of the system as being unfair towards black people, but only in African Americans and Hispanics who had those experiences. Specifically, the results show that, for those two groups, perceptions of injustice gradually increased as incarceration experience increased, 
For African Americans specifically, for instance, while 58% of those who had never known anyone who had been incarcerated believed that the courts were biased against black people, this perception increased to 69% nice, in those with vicarious experience and 78% in those who had personally been incarcerated. For Hispanic people, similarly, this belief increased from 45% in those with no experience to 51% in those with vicarious experience and 71% in those with personal experience. In contrast, no such trend was present in whites regardless of their experiences with the court system. As such, while black people in general seem to be far more likely to believe that the court system is designed to treat them unfairly, the prevalence of this belief is exacerbated by experiences with incarceration, both directly and vicariously meaning we end up perhaps in a vicious cycle of distrust, wherein black people, who for whatever reason you believe it to be, are statistically more likely to be arrested, causing not just that individual person to believe the system is rigged against them, but everyone else they know who is black to similarly increase in their perceptions of racial injustice. Well, that's just not the case for whites. To better understand vicarious experiences of criminal injustice and how those experiences affect people of different racial and ethnic groups, we can look to an analysis of Washington State residents from Mondock, Hurwitz, and Pathley 2017. Subjects were asked to think about how many acquaintances they knew, between one and three, who had experience with the criminal justice system. Let me clarify, that's not some glowy, are you friends with criminals question, but rather asked if they had experience in anything involving the police or courts, such as calling the police for help, talking with the police after a traffic accident, being stopped by a police officer for questioning after a traffic violation, being placed under arrest, going to court as a witness in a case, going to court to serve as a juror, or being a party in any criminal or civil court proceeding. Subjects were further asked to provide the race of these acquaintances and their perceived fairness of the acquaintances' encounters with the criminal justice system, as well as their personal perceptions of fairness of courts and the police. The differences in perceptions of fairness in this data set were immediately apparent with both the police and court experiences of white and Asian Americans being mostly positive, while they were mostly negative for Latinos and sharply negative for blacks. For whites, nearly 85% of vicarious encounters involved other people who were white, and those acquaintances generally all had a positive experience. I guess none of those white people were friends with any Irish or Italians, you know, because mob involvement. No, Aiden, the reason is that they're not white. When news of the massacre reached the Emperor, Adrian went mad. The reason for these findings could be due to acquaintance homogeneity, in that while over half of the acquaintances of Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans shared their same racial or ethnic group, more than 76% of acquaintances of African American respondents were also African American. For police encounters, whites, Asian Americans, and Latinos were exposed to more positive information from their acquaintances than were African Americans, who experienced far more negative vicarious experiences. Negative vicarious experiences with police and courts strongly influenced individuals' assessment of those actors. And because black people reported disproportionately more negative vicarious experiences, well, it's not surprising then that black people have a more negative perception of the criminal justice system. In addition to the reported experiences of acquaintances, personal experiences with criminal justice also skewed harshly negative for black subjects, with, for example, the mean of feeling one had been treated unfairly by the police for whites being 1.71 versus 2.28 for blacks. However, even after accounting for personal and vicarious experiences, black respondents remained significantly more critical of the courts than were whites, Asian Americans, and Hispanics. In other words, although vicarious experiences of acquaintances and personal experiences with the police negatively affect perceptions of the criminal justice system for people of any racial background, for African Americans, they always persist in more negative perceptions even when they have had no personal nor even know anyone with personal experiences from which they could gain vicarious exposure to the criminal justice system. In other words, African Americans are always more likely to think that the justice system is racist or discriminatory even when they have no experience with that system directly or indirectly. The problem then is perhaps that there will always be a perception among black people that the system is operating unjustly even if it's operating completely fairly. So even if we were to upend the entire criminal justice system tomorrow, even if we defunded the police, even if we released every prisoner from prison, extant vicarious experiences have already created a perception that criminal justice is an inherently flawed and racist system in many African Americans. This anticipation of injustice then likely deeply influences how many black people see the results of not just any particular court case, but how they see any interaction they themselves have with the system perpetuating the perception of injustice. And we can see that propensity in a study of adolescents and young adults interned in juvenile and adult detention centers from Woolard, Harvell, and Graham, 2008. 
Subjects answered questions regarding their anticipation that they would face injustice in the legal system in the future in a semi-structured interview format, including their beliefs that they would be treated fairly if they got in trouble with the law, that a lawyer would help them as much as any other client, how likely they were to be found guilty of a future crime, and if they would receive a similar punishment as others. In young people who had no prior experience with the justice system, African Americans and Hispanics whose levels of anticipated injustice were about even were more than twice as likely as whites to report they anticipated being treated unfairly in the future by the law. For those who had some limited experience with the system, black youths continued to see the system as more unjust than whites, but also believed they would receive an unfair treatment more than Hispanics. Anticipation of injustice increased twofold in whites who had some prior experience compared to those with no experience. In young people who had been more involved with the criminal system, all racial groups were between two and four times more likely to anticipate future problems with the law than those who had no prior experience. Specifically, while this increase was about two times in black and Hispanic students, it was nearly four times increased in whites, whose anticipation of injustice surpassed that of Hispanics. Moreover, African Americans and Latinos were more likely to anticipate the likelihood of a guilty verdict in their cases and more severe punishments. Compared to women, men were more likely to anticipate unfair treatment, less help from lawyers, and a greater likelihood of a guilty verdict. Age was also a variable in anticipation of future perceived miscarriages of justice across racial groups, indicating a development of cynicism over time, but there were some differences. African Americans aged 11 through 13 were less likely than Hispanics and whites in the same age range to expect future injustice, while those 14 through 15 years old were as expectant of said injustice as whites, both more so than Latinos, However, black people over the age of 15 were consistently more and more distrustful that they would be treated unfairly than were the other two groups. Young people with higher IQs were very slightly more likely to consider consulting with a public defender, while those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds were less likely to confess to the police or accept a plea agreement, illustrating that outside of race, there are several other factors beyond the control of young people in likely contributing to problems with the law, such as intelligence or economic background. Further, as experience with the justice system increased, youths were less likely to confess, accept plea deals, or consult with a private attorney, again illustrating the existence of a cyclical system wherein those who have been incarcerated once become jaded towards that system and then end up making decisions when they run into a similar problem in the future that is probably not in their own best interest. Criminality then becomes its own self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, it may just be that people who grow up hearing about how corrupt and evil the criminal justice system is, particularly towards black people, become not just more critical of that system, but also become more likely to receive harsher sentences due to their distrust in due process and essentially learned helplessness. Recently, however, much of the disparities in perceptions of the criminal justice system, at least in the US, have been framed through the perspective of critical race theory, or CRT, which has become an issue of increasing concern from education to policy which proposes that the seeming distrust towards courts expressed by minority groups in the U.S. is a product of differential treatment they experience in the extant systems, criminal or otherwise. CRT scholars posit that non-white people face unique discrimination and have unique experiences to express that may otherwise be overlooked in a colorblind society, and further that such a society actually exacerbates racist structures through its colorblindedness. As such, Long Gazelle, Parker and Son, 2011, asked A, does experiencing court lead to more negative evaluations of the institutions among minority groups than it does in whites? And among court users, what factors are more likely to predict a participant's perception of procedural injustice, using data from the public opinion on the courts in the United States survey conducted in 2000? Court attitudes and experiences, perceptions of disrespect, bias, a feeling of voicelessness within the system, and untrustworthiness of the criminal justice system were all assessed. Of those who had no personal court experience, whites were the most approving of the courts, followed by Hispanics and then African Americans. Interestingly, the percentage of white people who had positive ratings of the criminal justice system increased from 26.4% in those who had no courtroom experience to 31.2% for those who did. This was not the case among African Americans and Hispanic people with court experience, who were more negative towards the system than those minorities without court experiences. Almost 40% of black people who had been through the criminal justice system rated that system as unfavorable, and almost three times more African Americans disapproved of the courts than approved of them. The average rating of favorability among whites and Hispanics did decline slightly in those with more experience, but this effect in African Americans was comparatively far more pronounced. In other words, African Americans always expect the system to be biased against them, and direct experience with that system only exacerbates the perception of bias. Similarly, black people believed that they were more disrespected than did whites or Hispanics, and similarly saw said system as less trustworthy. In fact, race was the only characteristic found to significantly predict disrespect 
and then only in African Americans, not education, nor income, nor age, only racial background. Those of any race who felt that they had a lot at stake and very little control in their situation were all more likely to say that they felt disrespected, that the system was biased, that they lacked a voice, and that the system was untrustworthy. Feelings of having much at stake and lacking control was in fact the strongest predictor variable of all of these perceptions of flaws in the criminal justice system, followed by timeliness, affordability, and the type of case at hand. When race was included, predictive capacity increased from 27% only to 30%, indicating perceptions of vulnerability and having a lot to lose explained more negative perceptions of criminal justice than did race alone. As such, the researchers concluded that the CRT framework is a poor predictive model for understanding how people in the US see the justice system. And as such, the real issues likely lie elsewhere outside of race alone. So with that in mind, let's look at some of the more general statistics and perceptions of criminal justice across Americans of different races and ethnicities to better understand why it might be that reactions to court cases and trials have become so racialized and politicized. How do black people and white people see the system differently and why? It's important to note that FBI statistics as of 2020, never a good way to start a sentence, so let's just get it out of the way before we continue. Quiet. Friends don't let friends look up crime statistics report that black Americans are arrested for all crimes at levels that are significantly disproportionate compared to their population percentage. In fact, overrepresentation of African American arrest rates are so endemic that it's easier to point to the crimes which more closely reflect their population density, making up about 13% of US citizens, rather than arrests for which they are incommensurate, those comparable crimes being DUIs, breaking liquor laws, and drunkenness. In every other category of crime, African American arrest rates are vastly disparate from their percentage within the population. These are undeniable facts about arrest rates. And before you get upset at me for just reading them off, the questions that these pure data continually raise is, why are these rates the case? There are any number of variables that could contribute to why African Americans are so much more likely to be arrested than whites, and which variable one tends to prefer often seems based on political ideology. However, as with most things in social science, the answer is probably a combination of variables, from family structure to household income and socioeconomic status, to neighborhood quality, to redlining and over-policing, and then to more contested issues like systemic racism or the differences in IQ, which either side of the political aisle will seemingly erupt in rage at the very mention of. So for that reason, let's just not and say we did. I'm instead gonna sit here on my fence about it. Move over, Tim. Y'all can duke it out in the comments. Instead of looking at the causes and trying to myopically identify a single factor that is responsible for the reality that African Americans are arrested more often statistically based on population distribution, firstly because to try and lock in one variable as solely predictive is absurdist and a waste of time, but also because there's absolutely no way that even discussing the issue doesn't manage to infuriate pretty much everyone, something that's neither healthy nor useful for discourse. Instead, we should try to understand the effects of that outcome and how that relates not just to civil unrest that we have experienced in America over the last couple years, as well as reactions to the Kyle Rittenhouse trial and news of the Waukesha massacre, excuse me, accident, as much as rather vague, if not continually supportive statements from BLM on behalf of Juicy Smollier. So let's look instead at perceptions rather than causes. In their book, Justice in America, The Separate Realities of Blacks and Whites, Puffley and Hurwitz 2010 collected data from the National Race and Crime Survey to better understand why Americans of different racial backgrounds may react differently to exposure to court cases and police activity. 87.3% of whites reported they had never been treated unfairly by the police based on their race in the last five years, compared to 70.4% of blacks, which are significantly different, but not vastly so. Similarly, 7.2% of whites and 9.6% of blacks said their race had led to unfair treatment in policing at least once in the last five years. Larger statistical disparities appear for those who felt they had been the subject of unfair policing two or three times, present in 13.8% of blacks and 4% of whites, and those who felt they had been subject to unfair policing four or more times, present in 6.1% of blacks and just 1.5% of whites. That is, African Americans reported being subject of unfair policing four or more times in the last five years to a degree that was four times higher than reports of unfair policing to those same degrees in white subjects. Gallup polling data are illustrative that blacks similarly feel in general that they are twice as likely to be mistreated by the police than are whites, and were more than twice as likely to report being afraid that they would be arrested for a crime for which they were innocent. Clearly, there is a perception within the African American community that they are at unique risk of being victimized by the police, and certainly part of that is due to the raw FBI crime statistics which are indicative that such fears are not misplaced proportionally. 
Again, putting reasons for these differences aside, it's not just a reasonable concern statistically, but one which black people are more likely to have than white, that they will be mistreated by the police. Given the reality that black people are disproportionately arrested comparatively to their population distribution, a lot of this fear is likely accrued vicariously through news reports and community-based talk about this over-policing. Fears which were the impetus, at least on paper, for the summer of fiery but peaceful protests that resulted in the events of that night on August 25th, 2020 in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And so the courier who had cheated death in the cemetery outside Good Springs cheated death once again. And potentially the events of Waukesha. Polling data are illustrative of this perception as blacks are about three times more likely than whites to report or police stopping to question them, courts giving harsher sentences to blacks than whites, and police caring more about minority crime, all being serious issues that were facing America. Similarly, blacks were about two to three times as likely to state that they were treated less fairly in stores, on the job, or when dealing with the police than were whites. Likely, most of this perception is based, again, on vicarious experiences, as we saw earlier, as well as direct experiences with the criminal justice system. But due to that vicarious experience, it seems that even black people who do not report having been personally mistreated by the police, at least in the last five years, likely still also perceive the existence of systemic racial discrimination within policing. That's right, son. I got all kinds of cop words to say at you all night. This is unreal, man. Yeah, it's unreal. It's about to get unreal. -er. Despite this fear, however, African Americans are also far more concerned with crime than whites are, with 25% of blacks reporting being very worried about being the victim of a serious crime compared to 10% of whites, and with 57% reporting crime as the most serious problem facing society compared to 36% of whites. This is seemingly paradoxical in that while black people are more afraid of being victimized, and see crime as more of a dangerous issue, they also are more distrustful of the criminal justice system, even when they themselves have not felt personally discriminated against by the police. There are differences across African Americans in their reports of unfair treatment, however, across several variables. Black men and younger black people were both about twice as likely to recall having been mistreated by police based on race than black women and older black people. But one would think that more educated African Americans would report less discrimination due potentially to also being of higher socioeconomic status that was not the case. Instead, the more educated they were, the more black people believed that they had been mistreated by the police. Similarly, black people who considered themselves more liberal were also more likely to report discrimination. Thus, it seems that political beliefs and education level, so left-leaning black people, specifically women with a college education, are far more likely to see black people as being systemically discriminated against, despite the fact that they themselves probably have not been compared to those black people with lower education outcomes of lower SES and who are less politically active to be discriminated against. I don't want to say it definitively, but the data seem indicative that a lot of the perception of criminal justice, such as been the impetus behind BLM, is the product of wealthy, highly educated black women, not poor inner city black males, who statistically tend to be the actual subjects of the issue. Another important variable was the degree of crime in one's neighborhood, indicating that another predictor of feeling discriminated against by the police was related to living in a dangerous neighborhood. So again, paradoxically, often the black people whose communities most strongly rely on police to deal with crime also report more police discrimination, along with highly educated, young, liberal, black women. Hose man. Hose man. Hose man. White people who reported that they had experienced unfair treatment by the police were not more likely to believe that discrimination was systemic, while black people who reported unfair treatment were more likely to believe that their neighborhoods were being targeted by racial biases on the part of the police. For African Americans, political ideology, namely being a self-described Democrat, was a far stronger predictor of perception of discrimination than it was for whites, with white liberals seeing police discrimination as a far bigger issue than did conservatives. Both white and black people who held negative stereotypes about black people indicated that they believed over-policing was less of a serious issue. Less affluent blacks believed their neighborhoods were more subject to police injustice than less affluent whites. Black people unilaterally saw police discrimination as a more serious issue, but whites were more concerned with it when they lived in neighborhoods with higher black populations, Perhaps meaning they are more likely to have experienced that discrimination faced by the over-policing of blacks firsthand. It seems then that black and white people in the United States have a very different view of criminal justice that likely skews much of their worldview beyond that specific issue. Poor black people and white people who live in areas with a predominantly black population are more sensitive to potential issues of racial injustice. But at the same time, those seemingly most sensitive to perceptions of police discrimination are likely not those who actually experience it but instead more educated, more affluent, black and white liberal women, who again statistically are far less likely to be the victim of police racial intolerance, are the ones who seem to care the most. You are so white, you thought Malcolm X was Malcolm the Tenth. 
It seems that being exposed to information about over-policing vicariously is perhaps an even more potentially potent variable in the perception of discrimination than is actual exposure to police discrimination. That would certainly help explain a lot of what we've seen in the Black Lives Matter movement, being championed and led by, well, predominantly highly educated, relatively affluent black and white liberal women, who statistically are amongst the least to have actually personally been exposed to real police discrimination that may occur in higher crime neighborhoods, where, while residents may also report increased discrimination, also often seemingly report being more accepting of police involvement to help keep those neighborhoods from falling into complete and utter chaos, as they did in the BLM riots of 2020. So again, it seems those most concerned with over-policing or police misconduct are either those who have experienced it personally, and those who have only experienced it vicariously through news, social media, and political messaging and are still angry about it, but with less or no personal cause. Outside specifically of policing, many of the same trends we see are also present in disparities across racial groups in perceptions of the justice system in general. Black people were more likely than white people to believe that the justice system treats people unfairly and unequally, and that courts do not offer fair trials. They were also more prone to disagree with the assertion that black people commit more crime, or that young black people do not respect authority in favor of the belief that jurisprudence is inherently biased against them compared to whites. In other words, a denunciation of this astute assertion. Webster defines the moment as a moment when ignorance overwhelms the mind of an otherwise logical Negro man. What did you say, bitch? Hey, squeeze it! Causing him to act in an illogical, self-destructive manner. While these data are indicative that, in general, black people are far less trusting of the criminal justice system, further surveying reveals that this was largely influenced by personal experiences. Specifically, being treated unfairly by the police was associated with sharp decreases in appraisal of system fairness in both black and white respondents, and was actually larger in influence in white respondents, meaning that white people who believed they had been mistreated by the cops were actually more likely to subsequently see the system as unjust than were black respondents. It's possible that this effect is the result of black people being more commonly exposed to the idea that the criminal justice system is unfair, be it within their communities or from pop culture or from politicians and community leaders, and as such, when they experience a scenario that they believe is representative of injustice, that's less influential on them than it is in white people who have likely less cultural exposure to that narrative. An interesting curvilinear relationship was present in association with race, perceptions of systemic injustice, and neighborhood discrimination in that both black and white people who lived in neighborhoods that were subject to more policing believed the system was less fair. However, black people who lived in the least policed neighborhoods viewed the criminal justice system as more discriminatory than those who lived in moderately policed neighborhoods. While all black people viewed the system as less fair, this finding is again indicative that the wealthiest black people who live in the safest neighborhoods are more likely to be distrustful of the criminal justice system than are middle-class black people and have more dissimilar perceptions of systemic discrimination. So yeah, again, it seems that rich black people may be more likely to have issues with the government. I'm a supermodel. I don't care who the IRS sends, I am not paying taxes. Given that white people tend to see the system as more generally fair, under what conditions does that perception change? Well, again, it seems that white people who live in zip codes with a higher percentage of black people and in areas with more policing tend to be more distrustful of criminal justice. Perhaps because, as previously mentioned, they are more likely to be exposed to the statistically aberrant arrest rates of their black neighbors, which was a trend further reflected in these data. Women, and all whites, who had personally experienced perceived unfair treatment were also more likely to see the system as broken. White women who had a bad interaction with the cops then are probably most likely to see themselves as victims of a broken policing system. What a surprise. And if you date anybody that's bigger than me, you have to be sweet to me and kiss me. Tell me I'm- <laughs> Richer, more conservative whites viewed the system as less discriminatory, in comparison. For white people, politics played a pretty important role in perceptions of justice, but education was also influential on how those political beliefs influenced that perception. Namely, highly educated whites who leaned extremely conservative viewed the system as very fair, to about the same degree as highly educated whites who leaned extremely liberal viewed it as very unfair. Interestingly, whites who were very conservative and very uneducated viewed the system almost identically in perceptions of unfairness as did highly conservative, uneducated blacks. In turn, highly educated whites who were extremely liberal viewed the criminal justice system as extremely unfair to about the same degree as did highly educated blacks, regardless of their own political beliefs. Again then, this seems that black people who are extremely well-educated 
and thereby likely from a more privileged background and belonging to a higher SES, and thereby probably less likely to have grown up in the areas that do experience serious over-policing issues, are the most likely to see the system as racist, to the same degree as white liberals who are highly over-educated themselves. In opposition, highly educated white conservatives viewed the system as less discriminatory, but again, it seems that the privileged, despite probably being less likely to actually experience it in their own lives and their own neighborhoods, tend to be those most concerned with over-policing. Hey, can you give me some money? No. Fascist. To better understand how black and white people feel about these issues, the authors conducted an experiment wherein participants were provided with various write-ups regarding the disparity of policing for African Americans. Black people always believed the system was unfair against them, whether they were given accurate statistics, were told about the unfair treatment of blacks, or were told that blacks within their own neighborhoods were discriminated against in the justice system. While in turn, whites believed the system was less fair when told that blacks were subject to discriminatory treatment, and was the least fair when they were told this discriminatory treatment affected black people within their own neighborhoods. Yet whites remained more positive towards criminal justice across the board, regardless of experimental condition. Both black and white respondents in these datasets who believed in stereotypes about black people as being responsible for more crime also believed that those stereotypes were responsible for the disparity between black and white outcomes in the justice system. Older whites and whites from the South were also more likely to attribute black people's behavior as the cause of criminal justice disparities, while women and those whose neighborhoods suffered from higher crime rates were less likely to believe that black people's individual actions were responsible for said disparities. Wealthier, more educated black people were also less likely to attribute the overrepresentation of blacks within criminal justice as due to the actions of those individuals. Both black and white subjects were about equally likely to believe that criminal behavior of black people was responsible for their treatment under the criminal justice system overall, however. Similarly, for both groups, believing in anti-black stereotypes and being more conservative also predicted a perception that their treatment was fair or deserved. In opposition, both blacks and whites whose neighbors experienced discrimination were more prone to view black people as being mistreated. In an additional experiment, subjects read a short report about a recent incident in Chicago in which a police officer was accused of brutally beating either a white or a black motorist who had been stopped for questioning. Just an average day in Chirac, I guess. And I hope to harass and beat each and every black person I see with extreme prejudice. The report also stated that the police department promised to investigate the incident. Respondents were then asked two questions. A. How likely do you think it is that the police department will conduct a fair and thorough investigation into the policeman's behavior? And B. If he is found guilty of the beating of the motorist, how should the policeman be punished? Should he be suspended, fired, sentenced to one year in prison, or sentenced to two or more years in prison? Black respondents were more sympathetic to the victim of police brutality when that victim was black, but were also more likely to suspect that the police had good cause for pulling over the motorist. In contrast, white subjects were no more sympathetic towards a victim of brutality when he or she was white. White perceptions of the fairness of the police, however, were affected by victim race, in that while white respondents were more likely to believe that the state would conduct a fair investigation into the situation when they read that the brutalized motorist was black, indicating that while white people are just as sympathetic towards black victims of police misconduct as white victims, they also believe that the officer who perpetrated that misconduct would see justice for his actions. In contrast, blacks had comparatively very little sympathy for the white victim of police brutality and believed the cop would get away with his actions when they concerned a black victim, but not a white one. All people who were more skeptical of the criminal justice system were also dubious of the idea that the police had acted properly in the given scenario, regardless of victim race. However, perceptions of fairness of the situation were of a far greater concern for black respondents than they were for white ones. In regards to questions about the justice system at large, black people were far more cynical than were whites, in their belief that a fair trial was possible to punish the officer for brutalization of the motorist, but were twice as likely to think that the officer would receive a fair investigation when the victim was white than when the victim was black. This was not the case for all black respondents, as those who believed that the criminal justice system was fair also believed that the police officer was as likely to be investigated fairly regardless of the race of the victim. White subjects who believed that the system was also very unfair anticipated that the cop was very unlikely to see justice for his actions when the victim was white or black, while black subjects who believed the system was very unfair only anticipated a fair investigation was unlikely when the victim was black. When assessing the question of what sentence the cop should receive as punishment for his abuse of the motorist, some interesting effects occurred. 
Perhaps because those black subjects who indicated that they thought the cop who assaulted the black motorist was more likely to get away with his actions when they had little faith in the system, those exact same respondents were also more likely to suggest a maximum sentence for the officer when given a choice to decide his fate and allowed to rectify the system that they see is so unfair. Your Honor, League of Legends. Death. Oh no. As such, when given a choice to punish the officer, black people who think the criminal justice system is racist and discriminatory will want to throw the book at that officer. Of those who believe the system was very fair, again, black respondents were the most likely to give the officer the maximum sentence, but for this group, only when his victim was white. They were significantly less likely to proffer a maximum sentence when his victim was black, perhaps because they believed the black person was more likely to have actually done something or committed some crime, maybe due to personal experiences or maybe due to stereotypes. It's possible that black people with more faith in the system then may be more likely to also believe that a black motorist who was brutalized by the police was in some way deserving of it compared to a white motorist. This exact opposite trend was present in white respondents high in belief in system fairness, who are more likely to suggest a maximum sentence for an officer who assaulted a black motorist than they were for an officer who assaulted a white motorist. These results are indicative that black people do seem to have more in-group homophily towards other black people than do whites towards other whites when it comes to retribution for police misconduct, and may be particularly harsh when given an option to punish a cop who had victimized another black person, while being relatively unconcerned with white victims of police brutality. So say it with me, folks. Get a white male! There is a major exception to this trend, however, in the form of black people with high faith in the system, who instead are seemingly less sympathetic towards black victims and more understanding of the actions of the officer. Again, perhaps believing that the black motorist had somehow brought the brutality upon himself. Instead, white people always, regardless of their beliefs about the justice system, tended to be more sympathetic towards black victims of brutality than they were towards white victims, indicating a lack of the same kind of in-group homophily in whites at large that we see in black people distrustful of the system. But police brutality is a particularly vile concept that undoubtedly stirs up a lot of really negative emotions in people regardless of our race or politics. So in a second experiment, the researchers instead were concerned with something a little less likely to evoke a strong emotional response, and thus instead provided the subjects with a prompt concerning a police drug search. Specifically, respondents read about an incident wherein the police saw two young men, described either as African American or as white, both about 20 years old. They were walking very near a house where the police knew that drugs were being sold. The police searched the two men and arrested them for carrying drugs. Participants were then asked two questions. A. Do you think this is definitely a reasonable search? Probably a reasonable search. Probably not a reasonable search. Or definitely not a reasonable search. And B. Who are you more likely to believe in this case? The police who claim the two men were carrying drugs, or the two men who claim that the police planted drugs on them? Somewhat likely to believe the men, or very likely to believe the men? Oh! 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 oh. <laughs> there is a brown paper bag I have found on the premises. I must confiscate this, sir, and take it with me for clinical examination. Wait a minute, you just got that out of your pocket. What? Of those who had little faith in the system, black people were far more likely to believe that the search was unwarranted when the suspects were also black, followed by, to a significant degree, white respondents. Both black and white subjects low in faith in the justice system believed the search was least egregious when the subjects were white. In contrast, all of those high-end perceptions of system fairness generally believed that the search was more reasonable. But black respondents who had faith in the system believed the search was most unreasonable, albeit to a minor degree, when the men who were the subject of the search were white. Again, much as was the case with perceptions of police brutality, black people who think that the criminal justice system is fair are seemingly more likely to think that other black people have done something to incur police action. Perhaps this is evidence of what one might call a Uncle Ruckus effect. Ah, there you go. That's a fine idea, officer. Can't be too careful. I'm just gonna reach into my pocket and take out my safe to oil. When asked if they believed the men's claims that the police had planted drugs on them, black respondents who were lowest in belief in system fairness were the most likely to buy into the story when the men were black. Whites who believed the system was unjust were also more likely to believe the story, but race played little role in that belief although they were slightly more likely to believe the black men's claim than the same claim made by white men. Similarly, race was relatively unimportant for whites who were favorable towards the criminal justice system, who were also the least likely to believe the claims of the arrested individuals. Comparatively, black people were always more likely to believe the possibility that the drugs had been planted, even when they were high faith in the system. 
Interestingly then, while black people who have more faith in the criminal justice system tend to think that the search and arrest of a black man who was found carrying drugs near a known drug house was justified, they also still believe that it's more likely that the police are corrupt and planted those drugs than are whites who are similarly high in faith in the system. No, 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 no. You planted that in my car. Oh, did I? So it's really not a blind faith in criminal justice experienced by these black subjects who are still perhaps healthily critical of policing, perhaps again from personal experience, but rather that black people who believe that the system is operating correctly are also more prone to believe that operatives of said system are less likely to be in error as those who believe the system is deeply flawed and discriminatory. As such, while black conservatives, which we have pretty good reason to believe that at least some of these black people who are more favorable towards the criminal justice system probably tend to be, may still be more favorable towards the police, including even towards police brutality against other black people, possibly seeing said actions as justified. That favorability is not indicative of a unilateral acceptance of the system as holistically fair and without flaw or corruption. Therefore, I would be suspect to label such trends as a real Uncle Ruckus effect, but instead indicative that black people who believe the system works are also more aware that said system can be exploited and is vulnerable to the influence of bad actors. It could perhaps be said then that black people who have not experienced unfair policing think more like Spike Lee, while black people who have experienced unfair policing think more like characters in Spike Lee films. Looking more broadly at the criminal justice system in the US and perceptions of it, Pefley and Herberts asked black and white subjects about their opinions on a variety of topics related to jurisprudence. Black respondents were nearly twice as likely to strongly oppose the death penalty than were whites. However, while black people were less strongly in favor of the death penalty than were whites, support was more comparable across racial groups than was opposition. The vast majority, nearly 70% of black people, believed that the best way to reduce crime was to address social issues rather than to strongly punish criminals. A similar majority, about 75% of black respondents, disapproved of police use of racial profiling by questioning a black person merely because of a belief that black people commit more crime. Although that means that 25% apparently don't have an issue with racial profiling. Maybe I take back that Uncle Ruckus thing. Isn't anybody gonna help that poor man? Oh, 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 help me, help me, help me. Somebody help me, help me, help me, help me. Shut up. When asked if those who commit drug crimes should be punished more harshly or that the crime rate would be better ameliorated by creating more jobs, about 65% of black subjects strongly favored expanded job opportunities, while about 50% of whites were comparably strongly in favor of increased prison time. Opinions on three-strike laws were more nuanced, with black people having pretty mixed feelings towards the topic, while only 10% of white people were strongly opposed to three-strike laws. Nearly 90% of black subjects reported that the government should spend more money on investing in anti-poverty programs for the purpose of reducing crime, while only about 5% supported increased spending to build new prisons. In regards to the question of whether or not minors should be able to be tried as adults, about 40% of black respondents were strongly opposed to the notion, while a similar percentage were strongly in favor of the practice, as were 50% of whites. Fuck them kids. Fuck the kids? Overall then, it seems that black people are more likely to believe that the reasons for overrepresentation of arrests in blacks is a product of societal level issues and racial prejudice, which could be ameliorated by injecting more money into black communities. Since black respondents were very unfavorable towards the death penalty, something that certainly makes sense if you think the cops and the system are crooked and send innocent people to their demise, regardless of their race, the authors conducted an experiment to understand the factors that may influence perceptions of the death penalty. Black and white subjects were either asked about their favorability towards the death penalty in general, in the control group, or were given one of two questions that emphasized either the possibility that the practice could lead to the death of an innocent person, or one that emphasized that black people tend to be disproportionately represented in death penalty judgments. While in general, black people were about twice as likely to be strongly opposed to the death penalty as were white people, the framing of the question produced different results across groups. White people were 12% more favorable towards the practice when they read the argument which claimed the death penalty was unfair because African Americans were more likely to receive the sentence and were minorly less favorable towards the practice when they read the argument concerning the possibility of condemning an innocent to death. Uh, just to be clear, and going back to what seems to be a trend in white people being afraid to be seen as racist, that means that white people were seemingly more uncomfortable with condemning a guilty black person to death than an innocent of presumably any race. While both arguments reduced black favorability towards the death penalty, the issue of race produced less potent results than did the issue of innocence. 
that is, black subjects were 12% less favorable towards the practice when they read the argument concerning black people being disproportionately sentenced to death, while they were 16% less favorable towards the practice when they read the argument about potential innocence. Objectively, the correct way to think about this, at least in my experience. In an interesting turn of events, then, that exact same message, that which contended that the death penalty may be unfair because it seems to target blacks inordinately, produced changes in support to identical levels, 12% in both groups, but in opposite directional valence. Given that white and black people seemed to respond quite differently on the question of whether government spending should go towards prisons or towards anti-poverty programs, these scholars conducted another experiment to understand this difference in greater detail. Because of the possibility for in-group homophily, although as we've seen it hasn't really bore out amongst white people being particularly favorable towards others of their own racial group, it did seem to play a role in influencing black subjects' opinions towards various issues of criminal justice. And as such, in this experiment, the term inner city was used to replace explicit mention of the race of criminals. Your friends are the guys who dress up uh, in baggy pants and try to emulate the uh, inner city blacks. Guess we found out where all the news articles got the habit from. Although perhaps we should expect as much from a company called the BBC. Dick! Specifically, respondents were exposed to a short prompt reading. Some people want to increase spending for new prisons to lock up violent criminals. Other people would rather spend this money on anti-poverty programs to prevent crime. For some participants, while others read the same sentence with the addition of the term inner city to further describe said violent criminals, the prompt then continued. What about you? If you had to choose, would you rather see this money spent on building new prisons or on anti-poverty programs? While black people were always less in favor of prison spending, being less than half supportive of the proposal than were whites, the phrasing of the proposal also made a difference. White respondents were more supportive of increased spending for prisons when they read the statement that included the phrase inner city to describe the types of criminals who would be incarcerated in these new facilities. In opposition, black respondents were less supportive of spending when the violent criminals mentioned were also described as being inner city by nearly half as much. The total change from baseline was identical in power but reversed in valence across racial groups, such that white people were 4.2% more concordant towards increased prison spending in regards to violent inner city criminals than they were towards such spending on violent criminals in general, while black people were exactly 4.2% less likely to agree with such spending when the proposal included the term inner city. As such, even when taking away explicit mention of race, black people still tend to be less in favor of funding prisons in general, and particularly when they think those prisons would affect violent criminals from cities, which do statistically tend to have higher black populations compared to more rural areas of the country. Another possible influence that may affect the opinions of white and black people concerning the criminal justice system is the general politics that envelop any message about it, including the origin of that message. That is, it's possible that in-group favoritism of race may be affected by competing in-group favoritism of political identification, such that while both Jesse Jackson and Colin Powell are black, given their relative opposition to one another across the political landscape, it may be that people react to proposals from two individuals of the same race differently based on those individuals' personal political beliefs. As such, in an additional experiment, subjects read the following prompt. Let me ask you another question about three strikes laws where anyone convicted of a third serious crime is sent to prison for the rest of their life. The next sentence either read that some people in general, or that some people either like Jesse Jackson or like Colin Powell, oppose these laws. Some subjects read that the reason for this opposition was because prosecutors are more likely to use them against blacks than against whites, while others read that the reason for opposition was because many people are sent to prison for life for committing three less serious crimes like drug possession. The prompt then continued. Other people favor these laws because they keep repeat offenders in prison for life where they can't commit more crimes. What about you? Do you strongly approve, somewhat approve, somewhat disapprove, or strongly disapprove of these three strikes laws? In response to the prompt that mentioned harsh sentences being given for minor crimes in general, black respondents were most in favor of three strike laws out of all conditions, when they also read that the criticisms of these laws came from random people, rather than either from Powell or from Jackson. They were equally less approving of three-strike laws when thinking that opposition towards them arose from either man. In turn, white people were slightly more supportive of three-strike laws when they believed that either man opposed the law, compared to opposition from some unnamed random people. When asked about the problem of prosecutors using three-strike laws more commonly against blacks than whites, white people were more generally in favor of the laws than they were when thinking about the possibility that they may result in life imprisonment for petty criminals. Once again, when white respondents read that the laws were opposed either by Jackson or by Powell, they were even more approving of these laws than when they read that just random people were opposed. 
Black participants were somewhat less amicable towards three strike laws only when they were opposed by Jesse Jackson, but not when they were opposed from the general public or from Colin Powell. These results could indicate some degree of racial outgroup distrust on the part of whites who were more favorable towards three strike laws when they were opposed by black political figures, regardless of the reason for that opposition. Similarly, when Powell or Jackson opposed the laws due to some nonviolent criminals ending up with severe life sentences due to repeat offending, black people also seemed to react with in-group homophily, being similarly more opposed to the laws than when they read that the average person opposed them. Interestingly, there was not a ton of discrepancy in black support for three-strike laws when the reason for opposition towards them was that they tend to target blacks disproportionately to whites, regardless of who opposed them. Again, there seems to be a percentage of black people who seemingly actually prefer harsher punishments that might apply to other black people. The largest disparity was between black respondents who read that Powell opposed the laws who were more in favor of them than those who read that Jesse Jackson opposed the laws who were less in favor of them. As such, while it does seem that black people may be more likely to side with black political figures in general when it concerns the topic of criminal justice reform, when that topic specifically focuses on racial issues, they tend to have less in-group homophily towards another black person when that person is a conservative or a Republican, while they have more in-group homophily towards another black person when that person is more left-leaning compared to people in general. You better not never let Jesse Jackson hear you talking about that. Man, Jesse Jackson. No. On the topic of the death penalty, and using a similar method to the experiment we just discussed, some subjects were asked in general about their opinions on the topic, while others were either reminded of the possibility that errors in the justice system could lead to an innocent person being put to death, or that black people may be disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system. For both white and black subjects, who read that black people were more likely to face the death penalty, belief that black people committed more crime was influential on their opinions towards the death penalty, although this effect was more pronounced in whites than in blacks. Only black respondents similarly took race into consideration when assessing their feelings towards the death penalty when reminded of the possibility that an innocent could be put to death, and in general, black people were far less in favor of the practice. This seemingly indicates that even when not specifically reminded of a criminal's race, black people are more concerned with potential issues of racial discrimination in relationship to the death penalty. Stereotypes about black people, however, played no role in support for the practice. White women were always very negative towards the death penalty. However, black women who read that black people were more likely to be sentenced to death were actually more in favor of the death penalty compared to the baseline who read no such argument and who were against it to nearly an identical degree of power. Um, black women apparently want to kill black men, I guess. I'm just dead because I'll find you. Republican and conservative whites were only more supportive of the death penalty when thinking about the possibility that an innocent could be sentenced unjustly, but were unaffected by the racial argument, while political ideology and party identification had no influence on the opinions of black respondents. Higher education levels in whites were negatively related to opinions towards the practice when no rationale was given and when race was raised as a potential variable. However, more educated black people were actually more in favor of the death penalty only when the argument focused on the possibility of convicting an innocent. In opposition, wealthier whites were more supportive of the action when they read the basic question about narrative and when they read that blacks were overrepresented, but not when they read about the potential for an innocent person to be put to death. Income had no effect on the stances of black respondents. Interestingly, personal fear of crime also had no effect on opinions towards the practice in either group of people. To summarize some of the more perhaps unexpected findings from this section then, stereotypes about black people are not influential in people of either race in determining their opinions towards the death penalty. Instead, regardless of race, support for the practice seems to be out of a desire to punish wrongdoing, and while in general black people are less supportive of the death penalty than are whites, there are some important differences. For example, in that black men were much less in favor of it when thinking about racial disparities, while black women seemed to be more in favor of the punishment under that condition. So, what could influence the differences that we do see in support for this function of the justice system across groups? Well, perhaps it lies in perceptions of why black people are arrested at higher rates and therefore are more likely to even be subject to death penalty considerations, which was further assessed in white respondents who had read about the overrepresentation of black people in the criminal justice system. White subjects, who again read that the problem with the death penalty was that it was more likely to affect African Americans, were also asked if they believed the disproportionate number of black people who were potentially likely to even be subject to receiving the death penalty was due to structural, systemic racism, or discrimination, or due to some dispositional aspect of black people, such as culture or family structure. 
white people were most likely to oppose the death penalty both generally and strongly when they believed that differences in probability a black person may face the death penalty was due to structural issues, while they were more likely to support the death penalty when they believed that the cause of black people being subject to it was due to dispositional issues rather than structural ones. Across the entire sample of white respondents, strong favorability toward the death penalty, due to dispositional attributions, was three times higher than was strong opposition to the penalty due to structural attributions. Whatever people believe the reason is as to why black people are more likely to be overrepresented in the criminal justice system, be it in arrests or as recipients of the death penalty, I think we can all agree that none of these statistics are particularly, you know, pleasant. If there is structural systemic racism, well then that points to severe and serious flaws in jurisprudence. And if there are things that uniquely affect the black community, such as family, wealth, education, etc., that lead to these same trends, it's not like that's really much more of a palatable answer now, is it? Whatever the cause, though, the data are. And as such, we need might ask how we would fix these issues, through punitiveness or through methods of crime prevention, which is exactly what these researchers did. Both black and white people who believed that the problems related to criminality and justice facing the black community were dispositional rather than structural were more in favor of punitive measurements to about a similar degree. Similarly, general beliefs that criminal behavior is the result of personal attributes rather than systemic issues was positively associated with support for punitive actions over crime prevention in both black and white participants. Despite this trend, support for punitive responses to crime was negatively associated with the degree of punitiveness in both races, indicating that while black and white people are more in favor of punitive justice, when they tend to view criminality as a dispositional issue rather than a systemic one, that doesn't mean that people in general, even if they are in support of punitive justice, want that justice to be particularly harsh, they just want it to be fair. White conservatives were more supportive of punitive responses while political ideology did not play a role in black respondents' feelings on the subject. More educated blacks and whites were less favorable towards punitiveness. In addition to politics and education, location also played a role. Specifically, while black people living predominantly in black neighborhoods by zip code were less likely to support punitive punishment, when those black people also believed that the disparity in crime rates across groups is due to attitudes present in the black population related to criminality, they were actually more in favor of punitiveness to a degree nearly identical in the opposite directional valence as black people who lived in the same communities but did not believe the overrepresentation of blacks within criminal prosecution was attributional rather than systemic. All black and white people who believed the issue of crime lay in attributes associated with black people, whatever that attribution may describe, familial, cultural, or otherwise, were less likely to support preventative policies over punitive ones regardless of zip code. In contrast, both black and white people who believed structural issues were the cause of black crime rates were always more supportive of preventative measures. There was an interesting switch, however. Uh, the premise of the game is you take one finger, put it in your mouth, the other one goes up your When he says go, you switch. In black Americans who live in zip codes where 75% or more of the population was black, they believed that black people's overrepresentation in the criminal justice system was a product of structural inequality and were the most supportive of using preventative measures over punitive ones to respond to crime. However, that exact same group, those black people who lived in neighborhoods that were 75% black or more, but believed the reason for black overrepresentation in criminal justice was due to their personal attributes, were the most likely of all black people sampled to be in favor of punitive tactics. So once again, we see that there seems to be a big disagreement amongst black Americans regarding their feelings towards criminal justice. When looking at local support specifically, we can see that as crime rates increase in their locale, white people generally become more supportive of preventative measures to curb crime compared to punitiveness, while the exact opposite trend was the case for black people who are less supportive of preventative measures when they live in higher crime areas. That is, black people who live in high crime neighborhoods were more favorable towards punitive action being taken against criminals, while whites who also live in high crime neighborhoods were more favorable towards preventative actions. In turn, black people who live in the lowest crime neighborhoods were more amicable towards preventative strategies of crime, while white people were more amicable towards punitive ones. In other words, white people who live around a lot of crime don't tend to think that punishing criminals is a good way of reducing that crime, while black people who live in high crime areas do. And in opposition, likely wealthier black people who live in lower crime areas believe prevention is better than punitiveness, while again, likely wealthier white people who live in those lower crime areas prefer punishment over prevention tactics. Given that high crime areas in the US also tend to have larger black populations, it seems that perhaps black people who live in neighborhoods that are higher in crime and also higher in black population just statistically are more in favor of criminal justice as a punishment rather than social attempts at ameliorating crime rates, 
So basically this. Oh my lord, it's the creep that stole my pocket from three weeks ago. All right, all right. I feel a bit ridiculous that I even have to say this, but black people clearly are not a monolith. No, this is a monolith. We thank you, oh monolith. Противник, ты не уйдешь. Умирай. Нашри. Маневрируй. Ты будешь ликвидирован. Ну все, крышка тебе. Иди. Мать вашу. Граната. Why have you left us, oh monolith? No. And it seems time and time again that it is black people who live in neighborhoods most affected by the interactions between police and African Americans just statistically based on population, who also have the most conflicting views on policing and criminal justice, both being the most skeptical towards the system, yet also most in favor of punitiveness. White people in turn who live in the worst neighborhoods instead are not in favor of punitive action against criminals, perhaps because of their exposure to the worst elements of the criminal justice system. Whites further removed from personal experiences with crime, however, instead see punishment as the correct way to deal with criminality, while blacks with less exposure in their own neighborhoods to rampant crime instead see social prevention programs as preferable. Ultimately then, it seems that black people who are likely going to be less supportive of the police are also those who likely have not had any need for them, while blacks whose communities suffer from high crime rates recognize the importance of policing and criminal justice. Considering that the leaders of BLM and anti-police activism tend to live in mansions in extremely low crime rate areas that are predominantly white, well then, no duh. Those people likely don't see why policing is important, and oftentimes call for changes in society that would not only most negatively affect less wealthy blacks, but are changes that those black people in those higher crime communities absolutely do not actually support in practice, at least according to these data. So given everything we know about crime, race, and racism, as well as perceptions of criminal justice in America, let's come to a few conclusions. Over the last couple of years, racial tensions in the United States have reached a fever pitch, with protests and riots across the nation costing millions in damage and many people their lives, and often resulting in more criminal cases as a result, such as the case with Kyle Rittenhouse, who defended himself from violence that occurred in response to the non-fatal shooting of Jacob Blake by a white police officer. The news cycle has been filled with story after story of racially motivated crime, often typified by misinformation resulting in rage, misplaced or otherwise, between Americans, from the case of George Floyd to Ahmaud Arbery to Dante Wright, and even the events in Kenosha, which, while instigated in reaction to interracial violence, was similarly portrayed as being racist in nature, despite entirely involving white actors. Much as like porn, it seems that interracial is the most popular in the corporate news media. It seems that much of this animus is based on a perception among people, particularly African Americans, that the system is fundamentally broken and racist, and yet when black people are given an opportunity to serve on a jury, they seem oft motivated to enact racial justice through injustice by unfairly punishing white defendants. Black people in the US, likely with really good historical reason, see criminal justice a little bit differently and thus respond to it differently than Americans of other racial and ethnic backgrounds. And thereby it seems likely that these perceptions led, at least in part, to a cycle of unjust actions and thereby continual unjust treatment, perceived or otherwise, that may cause ongoing disparity that we see between arrests and incarcerations across different groups of people. Yet, it also seems that black people who are most affected by high crime are also the most supportive of the criminal justice system, while still being healthily wary of it. How can we ameliorate these issues faced by so many Americans? How might we mitigate feelings of racial animosity or need we completely upturn the extant criminal justice system and defund the police to solve these problems? Do you think that racism is the main impetus behind differences in policing and sentencing, or are there other cultural issues at play? How do we fix these seemingly endemic concerns? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Thank you guys so much for watching this very long video. I debated breaking it into two parts and really should have if I wanted to get at least part of it out before Christmas, but alas, here we are. I want to give an enormous thank you and shout out to all of the lovely people whose names you see scrolling by on the screen here for supporting me and the channel on Patreon and Subscribestar. You guys are truly awesome and allow me to do long videos like this that take a lot of time to put together. If you would like to see your name included, along with these fine fellows on the screen here in a future video, links to support are down in the description, where you can also find a link to my sponsor, Atlas VPN, and get 86% off your three-year plan. If you enjoy my content and want to hear more from me, I will be starting a podcast in the new year of 2022 with my co-host Spoon. Hi. Because it's not like there aren't enough podcasts already. But I think I can say with some certainty, this one will at least have a bit of a unique spin. The channel is called Broken Crown, where we will be covering news topics and politics, of course, with my normal social science perspective, 
but also should be just a little bit different from other podcasts, as Spoon and I both argue in favor of monarchy. If that sounds a little bit ridiculous that there are people discussing monarchy and seriousness in the current year, well, maybe. But hey, all the more reason for you to check out the show. Links to the podcast are down below, and I hope to see you all there. I really hope this video has been educational and not harmful in any way or hurt anyone's feelings. It certainly was not intended to, and I don't know how that would have happened, but that often is the case with sensitive topics. Particularly during this time of year, I really think it's important to see each other as individual people rather than as statistics, as useful as statistics can be. <laughs> So if I can make one final request at the end of this very long video, besides hitting the like button and subscribing if you're not already subscribed, it's to just be kind. Have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and as always, dear friends, Altana Volt.